Hello and welcome. This is going to be lecture number 10, all about light. Go ahead, put today's date and the lecture number at the top of your notes, and let's get started. All right, so let's start today's lecture with a diagram of a light wave. Another word for a light wave is a photon. A photon is a packet of pure light energy that might travel through a room. So one way that we can think about this photon is as a wave. So here's sort of a, uh, a graph of something that we're going to call the electromagnetic field. which is this mysterious field that permeates the entire universe. And when the photon passes through this field, it causes the field to vibrate up and down. So we can show the field, these field lines vibrating up and down as the photon goes past. So there's a few features of this vibration or this wave that we uh, should know the names of. One is how long does it take to go from peak to peak within this wave? That is called a wavelength. Another feature of this wave that we really have to know is the distance from the peak of one of these waves back to rest or to this midline. That is going to be called the amplitude. So in terms of how we perceive light, wavelength is going to affect the color of that light and amplitude is going to affect its brightness. So light of different wavelengths is going to have very different properties. So to better analyze these properties, it can be very useful to line up different wavelengths of light from longest to shortest on something called the electromagnetic spectrum. So at the very far end of the electromagnetic spectrum is our light, which has the longest wavelength. So longest wavelength. It also has the lowest frequency. And something that's correlated with frequency is energy. So this also has the lowest energy. All right, this light is radio waves. Radio waves. The wavelength of a radio wave can be as long as a football field. You don't have to know that, but just know that radio waves are very uh, stretched out. Next up after radio waves are microwaves. Then after microwaves comes infrared. After infrared comes the visual spectrum. So these are wavelengths that our eyes can detect, but they are really are no different than uh, other types of electromagnetic radiation. They just have slightly more energy and higher frequency than infrared and less energy than the next one, which is ultraviolet. All right, this also helps us put the visual spectrum in the right order because the visual spectrum is gonna go from red to violet, while infrared is just past red and ultraviolet is just past violet. After ultraviolet is gonna be X-ray, and then finally, we have gamma rays. So I do want you to know the order. I also want you to know that it's these last three that are the most dangerous because these are ionizing. This is ionizing radiation. It's all called radiation. Even visual light is called radiation. But when we talk about the radiation that's bad for us, we're generally talking about uh, radiation in this end of the spectrum, where we are getting to um, 
shortest wavelength, highest frequency, and highest energy radiation. All right, next up, let's zoom in on that spectrum of visual light. It started with the lower frequency red light. Next up is orange, then yellow, then green, then blue, indigo, and violet. We can remember this order if you just remember Roy, G, Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And I want you to know the relative starting and stopping points of this. Red light is at uh, roughly, let's write it in black, 700 nanometers. And violet light is uh, about 350 nanometers is where we stop being able to detect it. So if you know that range there, you can uh, estimate pretty well what the different uh, colors might be. All right, so another thing I really want you to know is the speed of light. I want you to know that it is constant for all wavelengths. Constant for all wavelengths. in a vacuum. So we will see that light does travel at different speeds uh, in different materials, but out in outer space or in a vacuum we create here on Earth, all light, uh, doesn't matter the, the wavelength, it's gonna travel at the same speed. And I want you to know that the speed is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That is a number that you need to memorize because it comes up a lot. And we use the letter C as the abbreviation for this number. So what is white light made out of? White light is all the colors. You might, not, you might have noticed that white wasn't one of the colors in our spectrum. White is a color that our brain makes up when it is receiving all of the different colors to the cone cells in the back of your eye. So if you've got all the colors put together, you have white light. So now how does a prism work? So you might have seen uh, a picture of a prism like the cover to a Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, a prism often is a triangle, although other shapes will work for a prism. What really matters is that you have some diagonal surfaces here. You're, what uh, you're gonna do to make a prism work is you need to shine white light straight into it. So in from one side has to come white light. Now that white light is gonna be bent by these diagonal surfaces. But what's kind of tricky is that the different colors are bent at different amounts. Red, doesn't bend very much. It's gonna bend once going in and once coming out, but it doesn't bend very much. While yellow bends a little bit more, and then a little bit more again. Green bends a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then blue, indigo, and violet bend the most. And so we see a rainbow or what we call in science, a continuous spectrum. So I'll just write rainbow coming out the other side. And the real key here is that the different colors bend different amounts. And what's ultimately causing the bending is that light travels slower 
in a crystal than in air. And it's actually, if we could zoom in on these white waves, what on these light waves, we would see the bottom of the wave hitting the crystal before the top slowing down and that's what's causing the bending. Just like if you're skiing and one of your skis goes into the powder snow, it slows down and that's gonna cause you to turn into the powder snow. It's exactly what is happening uh, with our light waves here. So my next question for you is how do atoms absorb photons? We know that light doesn't travel forever. Sometimes it bounces into things and is absorbed. If you are standing in sunlight and you're starting to heat up, that's because you are absorbing the light from the sun. Well, what's happening at an atomic level when atoms absorb photons? Well, so one thing that's happening is here's our atom. It's, well, there's our nucleus. It has electrons in different orbital levels. The first orbital level, if you remember, can only fit two electrons. The next orbital level can fit up to eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and on and on. Well, if this atom is undisturbed, all the electrons will fall down as close as they can get to the nucleus. But if a photon comes in and is of the perfect frequency to interact with one of these electrons, it can cause one of these electrons to jump up an energy level. So there we go. It has to be a specific wavelength. Can cause an electron to go up an energy level. All right, a specific wavelength can, can cause an electron to go up an energy level. And this higher energy electron is storing the energy from that photon. So we have, we're not violating the conservation of energy the energy went from being in the photon to now being in this electron. So now how do atoms emit photons? So if we've got that same atom, here it is, it had two electrons in its first orbital or energy level, and it used to have eight in this second energy level but one of them got hit by a photon and it bounced from this energy level out to the third energy level. So there it is down in the third energy level. So this atom wants to be as stable as possible. So that electron will eventually fall back down because there is a gap in that second energy level. When it falls back down, it releases light and it's gonna be the exact same wavelength as the light that first excited this electron. So the excited electron moves back to a ground state and emits a photon and we can label this up that is the same wavelength as the photon that first excited that electron so what is emission spectroscopy so this is a technique that scientists can use to identify an unknown sample what they do is they put that sample in a vacuum tube so that it's just a pure sample in a tube. And then they're gonna pass through it very high strength electricity. So this is electricity. It's a very high voltage, so it really wants to flow through this sample. 
Well, that's electricity is going to cause uh, the atoms in the sample to enter an excited state. And then as the electrons fall back down to a ground state, it's going to emit light. But that light is going to be only at the frequencies that the atoms are capable of producing. And so we look at these wavelengths and the wavelengths are like a fingerprint. So the wavelengths tell us the identity. So, and right in here, we've got atoms that are going from excited to ground. Excited to ground. And the, the wavelengths are going to tell us the identity of our unknown sample. Now, what is absorption spectroscopy? So this is a slightly different setup, but it's going to reveal the same information. So in this setup, you put your sample in a vial. And instead of exciting it with electricity, you're just going to pass white light through the sample. So this is white light. Now in the sample, that white light is going to bounce into atoms um, and be absorbed by the electrons moving up an energy level. And certain uh, wavelengths are going to be filtered out of the white light. So at the other end, we're going to have a continuous spectrum that has dark lines in it. And those dark lines are the frequencies that were absorbed. So the dark lines are the frequencies that are absorbed. And so that's why absorption spectroscopy is often called dark line spectroscopy and emission spectroscopy is often called bright line spectroscopy. And these work exactly the same way. And in fact, a sample that gives us bright lines in one location will give us dark lines in those exact same locations if we do absorption spectroscopy, because whatever light it absorbs should be the same frequency as the light that it emits. All right, we'll call that good for this lecture video. I'll embed a few more questions here for you and have a good rest of your day.